if you're saying you're doing a game-centred or game-based a- approach and clearly you're spending the majority of your lessons where, you know, or nearly all the lesson where children are dribbling a field hockey ball around cones, that's not a game-based approach. This is the Phys Ed Cast. Hello and welcome to the Phys Ed Cast. My name is Nathan Horn from iPhysEd.com and this is the Phys Ed Cast. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Harvey. Now, Dr. Stephen Harvey is an Associate Professor in Coaching Education at Ohio University, where his research is focused on teacher and coach pedagogy and practice and its influence on student and player learning. Stephen's been invited to deliver presentations and workshops on these topics at international, national and regional conferences. He's the co-author of Advances in Rugby Coaching, A Holistic Approach, and co-editor of two additional books, Ethics in Youth Sport and Contemporary Developments in Game Teaching. He's a co-developer of the Coach Analysis Intervention System iPad application by the Axis Coaching Technology Group. He's a secretary for the International Association for Physical Education in Higher Education, Teaching Games for Understanding Special Interest Group, a role he has held since January 2009. In addition to his research, Stephen possesses a wealth of practical teaching and coaching experience through his continued involvement working with teachers and coaches and students and players in applied settings. He has coached at junior international level and has worked as a national governing body coach educator, including delivering seminars to the US Olympic Committee as part of the National Team Coach Leadership Education Program. Prior to working in higher education, Stephen was a licensed physical education teacher and a further education lecturer. I hope you'll enjoy a conversation with Dr. Stephen Harvey. All right, so I'm here with Dr. Stephen Harvey. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm currently uh, an associate professor at Ohio University, which is in, well, south of Columbus in a place called Athens in sort of southeast Ohio. Um, I obviously hail from England because I don't have an American accent. Um, I work there as a physical education teacher for a while and then worked at community college level but then I was working as a soccer coach in the United States and enjoyed my time here so I looked at opportunities to be over here more permanently so I took a PhD at Oregon State and worked with Hans van der Maas and uh, started working there because I'd done a master's degree at Loughborough prior to that and worked with David Kirk doing a study looking at college um, soccer players and how they, um, how a, their coach using a game-centered approach, um, what they learned from that experience, etc. So I started working with Hans, brought sort of that game-centered approach stuff to Oregon State, and um, once I graduated from there with my PhD, I moved back to England for a while, worked at a couple of universities, doing some PE and some sports coaching stuff at both institutions and then got a job at West Virginia University back in the States on the behest of my wife. And um, <laughs> I, don't worry, I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then I'm enjoying it here, don't worry. And then I moved uh, to Ohio just this past fall because I wanted to take on a new challenge and I'm now working with sport coaches 100% of my time. Okay, great. So I guess soccer was your first love then growing up yeah i played quite a bit of soccer when like i started playing in like an older team i think the first team was u10 but i was only like seven years old and um so i got started pretty early with soccer but i actually didn't grow very much and so i transitioned to start playing field hockey because my brother played it and stuff like that but I, um, I was also a very high-level badminton player back in the UK, so I was always conflicted between playing 
you know, sort of multi-sport. And, you know, I played cricket and to a decent level, um, like a county level. I was a school tennis champion, you know, etc. So I had an affinity for being active and, you know, sort of turning my hand to various things and being okay at them. Yeah. You know? So did that? Did that? I guess lead you down the path of then wanting to to take physical education on as as something that was going to be a career for you, or were there other things that sort of piqued your interest as a as a young man? Not really. Uh, I mean, I played badminton at this local badminton club, and there was a few people who played there that were physical education teachers, and particularly one lady who I, her son and I played doubles in junior tournaments, but and he went off to university at Loughborough. Uh, which is one of the big PE schools. And so I kind of wanted to emulate him because he was a little bit older than me. But his mum and I played mixed doubles together. And so we built up quite a you know good, friendly relationship. And so I would ask her lots of questions about you know being a physical education teacher. And actually my badminton uh, partners, you know his, his mum that I played with, her husband was also a PE teacher. So I was all, always kind of intrigued. Um, and sort of playing a little bit on the school's badminton circuit, I'd, I'd met him and chatted to him. So it was always something that was uh, an interest of mine. So I, I, I went to try to get into Loughborough originally for an undergraduate degree, but then uh, didn't get in. So I went to Northumbria um, to do a sports, sort of sports science, sports studies degree. Um, and then from there, took a little bit of time out, but then eventually got into Loughborough to do my teacher license stuff. So I think it was always a thing that I wanted to do. Um, I'd, I've, I've talked about this a little bit before, but I, I always used to go like um, to the, the park. I remember like going playing cricket uh, with a friend of mine, and we just used to play the two of us. If you can imagine two people playing cricket, <laughs> was uh, was pretty thing. But we would do stuff like... Um, you know, we put little targets out and we play a little game between the two of us and I was a wicket keeper and he was a, a bowler, but we both bat um, and I had to bowl to him. And so we'd, we'd sort of practice together and make up little games. I used to play out in the backyard playing sort of tennis games and making up, like, pretend I was hitting with my left hand when I was, you know, Jimmy Connors or John McEnroe and they were playing against each other, um, Stefan Edberg and all this. So I, I was always out doing something. So I, to answer your question, I probably had no um, other thing that I wanted to do. And then I did do various jobs with doing different things, you know, as you grow up with your traveling and stuff like that. Yeah. And I never really did anything that I was sort of passionate about. I even like worked in a, a sports store, you know, thinking that was going to be cool over a Christmas period. And I was just like standing there, you know, bored. Yeah. Um, um, so... Yeah, being active, being involved in you know sports and physical education, and being physically active was all always a, a passion. And when I went to my first university, I got involved in um, doing some sort of coaching badges, one for field hockey and one for badminton. And I'd had a very actually, I don't have many role models. People always ask me that, but my badminton coach that I had when I was younger was um, was was good for me you know um and so he really inspired me with my badminton and I looked up to him as a, a coach and he was a full-time coach and he made a living out of it and so um he was t tutoring this badminton course so I took that and you know it was very um you know good to get involved in doing coaching from sort of like the age of 18 19 years old so I was giving something back quite early and that's another reason why you know, I wanted to be a PE teacher because I had those early experiences in in working with young people in those environments. Mm -hmm, for sure, and it sounds like like just listening to you speak then, and and knowing sort of the work that you're doing now, it seems like that the types of games that you were creating and the the types of things that you're doing with your friends back when you were were young have sort of led you to to become interested in the types of game centered approaches and um and sort of coach education and stuff like that. It seemed like you're you seem to be someone who thinks pretty deeply about uh, how sports work and um, how to best, I guess, play a game. Um, and that maybe started when you were a young person. So I've sort of heard you speak a little bit about coaching and physical education now. Like, would you say you're, you have more an affinity towards physical education, more an affinity towards coaching? Are they one and the same? Uh, is there sort of a, 
a, a clear separation between the two or do they sort of exist sort of in unison together? It's probably not unison, but there's a lot of overlap. I mean, you know, look at John Wooden. I mean, everyone says, what's the big thing about John Wooden? Well, John Wooden claims himself to be a teacher. Um, you know, and you look at a lot of sport coaches who, you know, Louis van Gaal, Gerard Houllier, uh, Ian McGee kind of rugby coach, you know, these are all physical education teachers. So I think it's um, not a natural progression, but it's it's certainly, um, you know, when you know a sport really well and you've got a really strong teaching background and know how to teach things to people, I think there's an easy sort of crossover and overlap. I think one of the big things I notice now coming over into like coaching sort of full time because I've, I have taught both, um, you know, simultaneously at previous institutions like in Leeds. And, um, you know, the connection for me was always about pedagogy, about teaching, you know, and you're able to teach in one and, you know, but, you know, teachers coach and coaches teach because you have to work one on one with students and coach them up and things like that. But I think the biggest difference now with coaching is just getting into the whole, um, stuff about team culture and being a leader and a role model, um, you know, that's that's huge. And, um, you know, the, the big thing about making an interpersonal connection um, and then having emotional intelligence as a coach, particularly for really high-level coaches, you know, when you see people like, you know, Greg Popovich and Steve Kerr, um, you know, at the, at, you know, the highest level and about how they're going to be successful, they're doing all those things really well but they have mentors who you know um support them and they've grown up through the game having those mentors um i think the problem with sort of physical education teaching i guess is sometimes we don't have mentors because you work a lot in isolation um and this might be where the the twitter conversation can go another time but that's where obviously a lot of us who know each other have met and you know find that community of practice there um but sometimes with you know, coaching, it's a, a little bit easier to to find that those role models and, you know, because people are out there in the media and things like that. So those are the, probably the, or that's the, probably the biggest difference, that sort of uh, team culture and things like that. But I do do some, like, work where I, I mean, doing coach development work, working, coaching coaches, and the stuff I've done in teacher education has been extremely valuable for that. And that's where, that work really makes a strong contribution. You know, that's sort of the, you know, working with coaches, asking questions, um, knowing, you know, what are good markers of good teaching? How can you give, you know, strong feedback to um, coaches about how they can improve their performance and things like that? So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's interesting because um, I've heard um, Ben Bartlett, who I know works with the FA in, in the UK, I've heard him speak before about, the idea of coaching coaches and how, you know, you do this badge and now you're qualified and off you go and you coach and there's no sort of follow-up of, of checking in to make sure that actually, you know, all the things that you've learned you're actually doing. So, um, and, and the same goes for physical education teachers often, you know, you get qualified, you go out into schools, you start teaching and you get stuck in, in the ways that more often than not teaching the way that you were taught. Um, so I think being reflective upon, whether it's your coaching practice or your teaching practice um, is really, um, I guess, vital um, and having that community of practice and having those role models and having that sort of um, ability to be able to, to have those discussions with, with people that are in similar situations to you is always, I think, beneficial. Um, so you, I guess we, we've sort of mentioned the word game-centered approaches a couple of times now, and I know you've done a lot of work in that area. I think my first contact with you or the first time that I came across your work was um, in an article um, that I found online using a generic invasion game for assessment, um, which I was looking at trying to improve my assessment practice and found that article and just, you know, just ate it up. I was reading it thinking like, yes, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, and then obviously dug, dug a little bit deeper into some of the work that you'd done, um, connected with you online and stuff like that. But for those people that aren't aware of, I guess, game-centered approaches, what is it and, and how how and why would I want to use it? Loaded question. Yeah. I'm kidding. Uh, it's a broad question. Um, so I guess game-centered approaches are uh, what Steve Mitchell, who's another game-centered researcher, calls um, like an umbrella term for various different versions of approaches that 
Um, a different paths up the same mountain is what he, he would say. Um, so some of them under the umbrella would be, you know, most biggest ones are known are like teaching games for understanding. That's a kind of an English, British, UK version. Um, the French version, the tactical decision learning model, play practice and game sense out of Australia. Um, the games concept approach, which was a bit of a mishmash of uh, the tactical games model, which is an American version, and TGFU, which is the British version. But the notion is that they're all trying to center learning around, at, or where the teacher centers learning around concepts rather than skills, and you focus learning around a, a, a tactical problem, where you then use game forms to teach students about um you know, guiding them to some potential answers to that tactical problem. Um, and within those tactical problems, there are various, as you know, various skills and competencies on and off the ball, depending on the sport that we or game that we need. Um, and so th the notion is that we situate learning in games first and kind of the skills come after we develop an understanding of why it's important uh, to use those skills in a particular game and when you know when they might be needed um so that's that's kind of that um what was your last bit of the I question i guess like if 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 i'm not familiar with it like why would it why would i want to use it and and where would i start well in terms of resources i think one of the things we're all like all of us including myself are all guilty of is we see all this out of latest stuff and we never read the original stuff. Um, and people can contact me. I'm sure we'll, we'll get into it about how they can access some of those original papers. So um, we can't see some of the stuff that was done in France and, the, and, and Germany in the 60s and, um, and, and sort of 70s, uh, et cetera. But, I mean, a lot of this conversation started with, you know, people like... Um, I think it was Alan Worthington, it's certainly Alan Wade, in soccer in the United Kingdom, where there was at least a conversation about, well, there are some sort of tactical principles or principles of play for certain games, you know, how to attack and how to defend. Things like we have to move and support each other, we have to keep possession, we have to, you know. So all those things were, were coming about um, there. So there was that literature, and then there was um, this sort of notion at Loughborough uh, and, and other researchers around the world looking at sort of game classification systems, you know, which games had kind of similar features. Uh, so like now we have invasion games, net games, etc. cetera. Um, so that sort of spawned the, um, the, the sort of the, the interest in sort of games and, and that kind of thing. And then the classification of them, which led to, um, you know, or which was a precursor to sort of the tactical, um, model or teaching games for understanding model that came about in the UK in the early 80s. And there were various um, papers published in that in the Bulletin of Physical Education in 1982 and 1983 about what the games for understanding approach is, how teachers can do it, very practical stuff, you know, um, how to set this, um, th this thing in motion. Um, and those then they kept getting written about the 1984 papers and the 1989 book um, and then Spanish publications with TGFU in that were translated there. So, but I would stick to those original papers in the 80s, 82 and 83, if you really want to read about it um, and sort of get a handle on it. The only other thing is I do have a TGFU resources thing on my website, um, Dr. Stephen Harvey with a ph dot weebly dot com. And it's just like a there's a resources tab and a, a TGFU one-stop shop and there's some you know videos we've done from the phys edagogy phys ed summits so people can go there it's kind of like what is TGFU how do I use it in net wall games how do I use it in invasion games how do I ask good questions and how do I assess learning and all those are on there and that's a good resource as well okay. and that on my website but also those videos and um, the open access um, to everyone Great, perfect. I'll be sure to make sure that we uh, we include uh, a link to that as well. And then, why would you use it? Yeah. Now, now, there's a million dollar question. I think I was talking to someone earlier today, and I think that um, without being evangelical, um, I, I think a lot of us 
kind of can see and feel as teachers about when we get in that flow state with our with our learners and when they're in flow and when we're in flow as a teacher. Um, and I think what teachers kind of feel is when they use a game-centered approach and they start this, the lesson with a game, that immediately children are interested and excited about being in the lesson. And even if it's not like at the younger ages, even if it's not like a true game form, like in an invasion game, like three versus three, or, you know, like they're not playing an international badminton match, but they're, they're kind of knocking it over the net. Even if it's just me and you um, getting a rally going and being successful, you know, there's, there's a sense of accomplishment with that. And it's kind of fun and it's playful or what Canada, um, came out of Canada and, um, what we know is deliberate play and deliberate practice. So it's more deliberate play, right? We're playing, we're doing something meaningful. Um, and so immediately there's that effective kind of component that sort of charges the students up, if you like. And then what we can do off the back of that is start to work within, okay, so what's going well in this game? What, what, Where are some of the areas for improvement? Okay, so what skills would we need in order to make those improvements? Well, let's work on those, and then let's go back and play again. So um, I, I kind of don't like saying this, but it's a little bit like whole part whole in the sense of you've got the whole game, and you can work on a little bit of the part and then go back to the whole. Um, you know, there's a little bit more to it than that, but that kind of notion of starting with the end in mind, what does this game look like? How should it be played? What things do we need to uh, do to be successful in this game? Let's work on those and then let's play a game again. That's kind of the uh, the idea. So there's effective component. It gets students motivated, gets them interested and excited. Um, it, you know, you can work on tactics and skills at the same time, but maybe give preference to tactics before you do the skills, but you can work on them in tandem. Um, so you've got that kind of um, thing. And some research that I've done is, you know, we suggest that um, kids can get a good level of physical activity because they're playing in games, they're moving around and they're getting sort of high levels of physical activity by participating in game situations rather than standing there doing sort of isolated drills. And there's, I'm not standing here saying drills are bad. Drill, uh, drills or exercises, skill focused sessions have a purpose but it's, um, you know, they come after, you know, that um, game form has been played. Last time on the Phys Ed cast, we caught up with someone who could be considered the godfather of physical education, and that was Adi Kamiya. I've always said, as a, a guest of it, for me, I say, I've always said 20 to 25% of us are physical educators. I don't know what the other 75 to 80% of us are. I think they might be game producers. They might be um, activity producers. But I really wonder if they're physically educating the children and youth that they serve. If you haven't had a chance to go back and listen to that episode, I highly recommend it. Artie is uh, absolutely a uh, wealth of knowledge of physical education, so please take the time to go back and check it out. Next time on the Phys Ed Cast, we'll be catching up with another professor from the University of Alberta, Dr. Doug Gleddy. The punishment was to uh, miss all recesses and Phys Ed uh, on another day. And I just think, you know, we're... So I just really... I. Um, I took that and I asked the parents, I said, can I use this in a blog post and can I, if I make it anonymous and they were fine with that. And, and so I was really angry about it because we wouldn't do this with, I don't think almost any other, well, that's not true. We do it with art and music as well, but to take away a curricular subject, um, because a kid is misbehaving, we would never do that. And it speaks to where people value physical education and they value it not very much. But for now, let's get back to Dr. Stephen Harvey. For sure. I think for me, it's always been about and the reason that I, I like to take a, a game-centered approach, whether you want to call it teaching games for understanding, whether you want to call it tactical games, whatever you want to call it, is just the idea of developing players who are able to think their way through situations or students who are able to actually just reflect critically on what they're doing. And 
uh, anyone who's taught physical education, especially if it's been at the elementary level, you know that kids, the first thing that they ask when they come into a gym or they come onto the field is, what are we playing today? What game are we going to play? So mm -hmm. they already have that sort of like motivation inbuilt into wanting to play that game. And I think for me, my role as a teacher then is to get them to, to think about that game in a critical way and think about, well, how can I, one, improve my performance? How can I uh, develop the knowledge to be able to be successful in this game? And, and more often than not, that's that, that tactical understanding. If they understand how to play the game um, and what they need to do within the game to be successful, then the skills will, will sort of come secondary to that and mm -hmm. we're able to work with them on that. So for me, that's been, I guess, my my approach and similar to you like you, you mentioned as a kid you know getting out in the in the um in the park playing with your friends creating these games creating these scenarios where you're you're doing things it's the same with me and my brother i remember uh for anyone who uh is familiar with like rugby league um you know the state of origin queensland versus new south wales now i lived in tasmania we had no connection to queensland or new south wales but we'd watch it on tv and me and my brother would be out in the in the front yard, he'd be Queensland, I'd be New South Wales, and we'd create this this entire game and work our way through it. So, um, I think for me, like it's similar to you, it's always sort of been there. Um, and and now, I guess my purpose is to try and you know enable the kids that I see every day to to have that love of, of being able to be successful in a game because I think all kids want to be successful. They want to win. They want to feel good about their participation. And I think if they don't understand the, the tactics of the game or how to actually be successful in the game, then it's not going to be fun for them. Uh, they're going to feel um, left out or, or not successful and then they're not going to want to continue to play that game and then that's going to affect, you know, activity levels and it's sort of this this ongoing sort of uh, thing there. Uh, one thing that, I, that I, I wanted to ask you about was that idea of you were talking about going back and reading that original research from the past and, and we've, we've mentioned a lot of different terms, teaching games for understanding, game-centered approach, tactical games model. Now, they're all very similar, essentially. Um, I think something that I hear from teachers often is, you know, well, I'm doing teaching games for understanding or I'm doing a game-centered approach and, and um, maybe they're not doing it exactly how the research has it, has it laid mm -hmm. out. Um, what would you say to, to people? Because I'm, my belief is that, you know, everyone has their own situation. Everyone has their own environment in which they're operating in. The kids are different. Is it okay to have a, a, a sort of a hybrid of all those different things and, and, and pick bits and pieces from things? Or would you say like stick with the, the model as it's, as it's described in the research? Well, I mean, we all have to make accommodations. I mean, if, if you are saying you're doing a game centered or game based approach and, Clearly, you're spending the majority of your lessons where, you know, or nearly all the lesson where children are dribbling a field hockey ball around cones. That's not a game based approach. Um, so there are, you know, some what the literature uh, researchers would say, like immutable features of um you know, like the, there's one here, like a, a benchmark saying you must start the session with a game form. I mean, the game form to me is very loose. You know, a game form could be two versus one. It could be one V one. It could be, you know, a tag game, you know, like a passing tag in basketball. So, I mean, it, you might consider that to be good enough to be the initial game form. But, um, I think if you walk into a lesson and, um, like play practice, if it, what they say is like, if you sort of build it and game sense is the same as you kind of start two V one, or, you know, you build it up and so you finish the lesson like four on four and you go through those various kind of layers or builds that I hear um, people talking about here on Twitter and Voxer. And that that's fine. You know, the, the notion is that, you know, the, the learning is contextualized in, you know, in that game, uh, you know, in, in the, and it reflects the game. Um, you know, some small marker might be do you spend 50 percent or more of your lesson in some type of game form where you know students are able to work independently of the teacher um that game form is framed by a you know a problem statement that you make you, you know um you know i want you to get the ball from a to b and i want you to work out how best you're going to do that in your group of four you know, so I think uh, you're right. We can get het up about, um, you know, meeting all these kind of benchmarks. But, 
get, you know, and overly um, sort of like focused on them. But some of them do give a good guide to whether you are meeting sort of the the demands of you know but another one is that you know do i ask lots of questions well the 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 notion of because that's one big feature of a kind of a game-based approach um and um you know if you're not asking questions you're not doing games from there well it depends because if you're working with younger children maybe setting up an appropriate game form that has certain modifications to it in terms of you know, multiple goals and things like that might be enough to sort of teach those young people and give them um, like an implicit experience of a game where they're learning by doing and it's more deliberate play. Uh, whereas you might be focused in a coaching setting with some older players about making it very deliberate practice. So the goal is very explicitly stated about what you're doing Um you know, you you uh, talk through those constraints and the whys and wherefores, but you you know, but you're still kind of centering the learning around a particular game form. Um, you know, to to get those students working at looking at techniques and tactics, uh, you know, simultaneously. Um, another kind of thing that's probably related to this discussion is is that tactics techniques debate in the sense that. I think there are exercises, well, I know there are exercises, and Adrian Turner talks about this, that are more tactically focused and some that are more technically focused. And when you set up your activities, you got to decide, is it going to have a more technical focus or tactical um, or technical tactical? Um, and so as you go through the phases of a, a, a game-centered approach lesson, some activities might have, like I say, more of a tactical focus, uh, and some might be more focused on developing a particular technique that is then going to be used in the game before you go to a um, a game at the end of the lesson that's modified to you know bring out some of those techniques in a tactical situation. Um, so the literature suggests that teachers should be good game designers, right? Um, that they should situate learning in a game as kind of or game form as as kind of much as possible. And that they provide opportunities for dialogue and discussion where appropriate, because obviously with younger learners, it's, you know, and you do that by asking questions and you promote a positive social, moral environment. So, you know, games bring up lots of problems, don't they, for children to solve. So they've got to communicate with each other. You know, they've got to work through conflict and that kind of thing. So that's one of the, again, the beauties of, you know, doing game-centered approaches because they sort of bring up situations that you might not think would come up normally but they come up naturally and that provides teaching moments for teachers to um, sort of give more sort of um, I guess life lessons within their physical education uh, class yeah for sure like I just I just had a just before speaking with you I just finished with a bunch of grade four students um, playing a, a um, modified invasion game um, and you talk about being a game designer and that's something that I really try to, to do a lot is when I'm thinking about the types of games we're playing is thinking, well, what, what is it that I, what, what behaviors do I want to see from the students? What do I want them to experience? Um, we were working at being able to maintain possession and, and, you know, transport a ball from point A to point B, like you're talking about. And, and what I noticed was that, uh, you know, there were two or three kids on one team that were very successful at that and very efficient at it. And what that meant was that then their teammates weren't, uh, getting the ball so I was thinking okay well how can I modify this game to make sure that you know everyone's being successful in it and everyone's having an opportunity so all I did was I said okay now um, if you want to score more points for every person on your team that touches the ball before you score you get an extra point so if you pass it to four different people on your team and then you score you score four points um, mm -hmm. so that enabled the kids that were really successful at it to now bring those less successful kids into the game. It motivated those less successful kids to actually want to be a part of the game because it, now they were being passed the ball as before they weren't being passed the ball. So I think often as a, as a teacher or a coach, it's I've, I have sort of talked about this before when I've been working with teachers about you almost have to be almost like a doctor where you're, you're diagnosing a problem. You're looking at what is the problem in the game um, you know, evaluating what, what can you do and then responding and, and actually giving some sort of 
prescription or uh, putting something into the game that's going to actually make that a little bit better. So, um, and the and the scary thing though is that some teachers might say, "Well, I, d- I don't know this game very well. Like, I don't know badminton very well." But you know, the notion there is, well, set up a game form and see what happens, yeah. and then ask the children, you know, oh, what's going well? What's not going? Well? What should we do about that? Oh, well, I I think I should play on a you know, a smaller court and they should play in a bigger or I need more touches, you know, than they do, you know, or I'm not getting the ball, but they are. So what, and then, well, what should we do about that? And I think that those things can happen naturally. And it, and as you observe and you hear some of the issues the students talk about, um, you can start to then realize how the game is constructed and build up your own sort of content knowledge, let's say about the game. So you don't have to wait till Rome is built to, kind of have a go you can kind of build it as you go along because you've got to start somewhere yeah i think you're right i think yeah if i'm reflecting on my kids it's yeah it's often you know when we do change rules in games or when we do um it's when we have those issues and and it is listening to the kids and and the issues that the kids are having with each other that you then realize like okay like this is an issue for them you know let's solve it together And, and sometimes they have the answers sometimes you need to work together um, sometimes they'll get frustrated with the changes that you make, but it's it's then you know all those life lessons as well that that you're talking about. Um, I know that we're we're sort of getting a little bit short on time because I want to keep this yep. about thirty minutes, and I know you have to to head off. Just a couple of quick questions before we go, sort of rapid fire. Um, just sort of the first thing that comes into your head, not not long answers, just really really short. Um, I guess what does what does physical education mean to you in you know twenty five words or less? Well, I, it's a shame for me that it's not the other way, education through the physical. You know, I, th- I think that's probably what I would say as a sort of retort to it because I have a very educative purpose in everything that I do. You know, when I go out and coach, it's very educative. Um, it's not just about running around cones. And I think uh, a lot of us who are, you know, connected n- know that that's the, the case, you know. Okay, great. I love that answer. That's fantastic. Um what are you not very good at? What's something that, that Stephen Harvey finds really difficult on a day-to-day basis? Well, on a day-to-day basis, I was going to say my wife would tell you that I'm no good at dancing and I can't sing, but I love karaoke and I've just spent uh, some time in Japan and I love going to the karaoke place, but I'm no good at it. Right. Um, so I, I can't sing and I can't dance. Okay. Um, what am I not very good at every day? Uh, I'm probably not very good at being a parent, but I'm trying my best to get better every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very honest answers there. And I, I like to ask that question because I think it, it's, you know, a lot of the people that I talked to on here are very reflective people. And I think that um, being able to, I guess, uh, reflect on what you're not good at helps you to be able to improve as a person. And, and uh, I think if you're able to, to be as honest as you were just now, then that, that shows that, you know, you're someone that thinks about life and thinks about, um, I guess, your profession and, and stuff like that. So that's, that's why I like to ask that question. And then last one, I guess, what's worth doing in physical education? If You know, the start of uh, um, that Teaching Personal and Social Responsibility book, I think one of the first quotes is, you know, what's worth doing? And I think there's so many things out there in physical education, so many different approaches that people can take and things that are, you know, whether it's a trend or whether it's something that's, uh, you know, the, 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 the hottest new thing to do in physical education. If, if, if it was up to you, what's, what, what's worth doing? What do we need to really be focusing on as a profession? Well, I think at the younger stage, it's about what Jean Cote would say is that making children enjoy coming back tomorrow. So if they enjoy the physically active life, I think that that's important. And that's going to be done from an early, um, you know, early, early start. Then I think it's about building competence, um, you know, actual and perceived competence. Um, And then it's in the later years, it's about connecting their enjoyment and competence to things in the local community that they you know and and, you know what are their choices for what they're going to do when they have a wife and a child and a job and things like that so I think that those have got to be the three things and in a developmental journey those would be the things that I would be looking to do and you know lo and behold TGFU you can do sort of the the, game centered approach you can do those three things through that, you know, but I'm not saying that that's the only way of skinning the proverbial cat. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, for spending some time with me today. You sort of mentioned before your uh, your website, uh, Dr. Steve, is it Stephen Harvey dot Weebly or Dr. Stephen Harvey? Harvey? Yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Stephen with a PH Harvey dot Weebly dot com. Okay. Um, so that's the website, um, and there's a contact page on there, so you can get in touch with me there. Um, I am. Harvey, my last name, H-A-R-V-E-Y-S-3 at ohio.edu. Or you can get me on Twitter at Dr. At Dr. Stephen Harvey. Okay, nice one. Well, thank you so much again for, for spending time with me. I think we might have to get you on for another episode of uh, karaoke by the sounds of things. Um, we do a there special karaoke session. Um, but, yeah, thanks for, thanks for chatting with me today. Um, if anyone who's listening wants to get in touch with, uh, with Stephen, you can, he's just told you how to do that, and I would highly recommend that you do if you have questions around game-centered approaches. He's definitely someone that is worth uh, spending some time chatting with. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, and, uh, yeah, let's hopefully catch up again for another, another one maybe a little bit later, and we can talk about the Twitter study that you did. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Right. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Phys Ed Cast. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Stephen Harvey. I'm sure that uh, everybody got a lot out of it. I definitely did having the conversation with him. He has an absolute wealth of knowledge around coaching and teaching games. Um, as you heard in the episode, he had a big influence on the assessment in Invasion Games uh, blog series and assessment tools that I created. So a huge thank you to him for that. If you're enjoying the Phys Ed cast, if you enjoyed our last episode with Adi Kamiya and you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Stephen Harvey, it would be really great if you could just take a few minutes to go to iTunes to rate and review the show um, on iTunes. It will definitely help us um, in getting the show out there to more and more physical education teachers and coaches um, out there around the world. So if you've enjoyed it, uh, I would really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Uh, If you're not also aware, you can access this show on a variety of different podcast providers. You can get it on iTunes, you can get it on Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, Radio Public, uh, pretty much anywhere where any good podcast can be found. So you can listen to it uh, anywhere and everywhere. Um, And you can also listen to it through our uh, own iphyzed.com app. You can find it on the App Store, both in the iOS App Store and the Google Play Store. Just search for iphyzed, I-P-H-Y-S-E-D, and you will find it right there. You can listen to it directly in the app. You can also access all of the other fantastic content that we have on iphyzed.com straight through the app there. You can watch webinars. You can access uh, all of our resources, blog posts, connect to the physical education community through that app. It is available now on the App Store and Google Play for free. So please go and download that right away. Looking forward to joining you again for another episode of the Phys Ed Cast where we chat with Doug Gleddy from the University of Alberta. Until then, my name is Nathan Horn from iphyzed.com and this has been the Phys Ed Cast.